Hello my study buddies, painting buddies, workmates and procrastinators. Welcome back to the studio where today's session is sponsored by Skillshare, but more on that later. For now, whatever it is that you're up to for the next hour, let's do it together. We will keep each other focused, keep each other accountable and if nothing else, keep each other company. As always, let us know what you're up to down below and yeah, let's just get started. Today's episode is going to be just the slightest bit different. I did talk along as I was painting live as I usually do, but I wasn't really happy with the video in the end and I'll touch on that later. So I'm just going to talk over the footage and hopefully it won't be too jarring if my hands are speaking out of time with my voice, but I'll do my best to edit anything like that out. For today's painting, I wanted to get back into gouache landscapes. At the beginning here, I was talking about how I got this set of Winsor & Newton paints for Christmas from Ozzy's auntie and how I just thought it was such a thoughtful gift, especially knowing that she knows what medium I use the most. And obviously these are lovely quality paints and they were really enjoyable to use. I'm working in this sketchbook that was sent to me by a British company called Art Gecko. This was my first time using wet media in here and I was surprised at how the pages held up because they did feel quite thin, but I wouldn't feel confident going any wetter in here, like doing watercolor washes or anything like that. And I'm painting from a reference that I will have linked below and I have a uh, marked off the edges with washi tape. Now the reason I went for a landscape for this painting session was honestly just to give myself a bit of a confidence boost. Some, it's like the same with um, my journal page that I shared with you last week. I've been a bit unsure of myself recently, of my style, of my ideas, and instead of letting that uncertainty cripple me into inactivity, I'm embracing the things that I know I enjoy doing regardless of how they turn out. So journaling is one of those things and painting landscapes is one of those things. Both of those I feel really like I need to do more of those. Um, and then while I'm at it, it's important to challenge myself and not just sink into my comfort zone. So it's been great getting back into Patreon, for example, to like set myself the task of building these reward bundles with stickers and prints and things. I was able to push myself and because it's for other people, I really had to dig deep and make sure I was producing quality, which I feel I did. And that was a confidence boost to remind myself that I am capable of making art that's worthy of print and turning into stickers or whatever else. I want to do with it. Another thing I always stress the importance of, especially when you feel stuck like this, is returning to some form of study, whether you're studying the work of artists that you like or delving deeper into a topic you're interested in, inside or outside of the creative work you're doing. I've been really interested in doing more with my artwork, as much as I love working in my sketchbook and, I don't know, making those stickers and things it just reminded me how much I like making things and having my art out there on things and so I'm trying to think more conceptually and more methodically instead of just winging it and one thing that's really helped with that has been taking classes on Skillshare that are more focused on illustration. Skillshare as you know is an online learning community for creators where anyone can take classes anytime on all sorts of topics from creative writing to business and marketing. In looking specifically at illustration classes, I've been able to get a better idea of the storytelling side of making art and that really aligns with the projects that I want to work on this year and it's really helped to build my confidence going into all that and I've been able to hone in on specific areas where I feel like I need a bit more guidance and then get that guidance from some incredible experienced creatives. The class I took most recently was by illustrator Victor Nye who I was so thrilled to see as a teacher on Skillshare because I've been following her work for years so to get an insight into her process was just so invaluable. In her class, Colour Masterclass, Simple Steps to Create Vivid Art, she goes through the basics of colour and studies some masters with you to break down what makes their use of colour so effective. She just explains things in a way that's really clear and easy to then take forward into your own work. I especially appreciated when she talked about the ratio of different colours in a piece. It really just simplified the whole process of coming up with a colour scheme and I think that's a class I will come back to time and time again. So if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description, you can take that class for free and however many classes you like for two months after that. After the free trial, annual membership comes to around $10 a month for unlimited access to as many classes in their ever-growing catalogue that you like, so don't forget to check out my Skillshare link below to give your creative work or your confidence in it a boost. Because that's where I'm at now, a bit more leveled out when it comes to knowing what I'm doing. I feel like I have 
more of a direction again. The reason I didn't like the original narration of this video was that I filmed this before I had done any work to ground myself, so to stop myself from aimlessly floating and figure out what I wanted to be doing. I felt a bit down and a bit directionless, and while I didn't talk about that in the original video, I felt like my self-doubt was coming across in whatever I was saying. I think it's normal every once in a while to just have a pause, regroup, even journal it out. Where am I at? Where do I want to be? How do I get there? And then put in the work, just keep creating and keep learning, and of course, just keep trying. Another thing that needed recalibrating since the beginning of the year was my daily routine. You may have seen my like attempting my ideal work day video where I kind of had it on paper what an ideal day would look like for me. And as you would see in that video, it didn't really work out the way that I planned. Obviously, that's just how it goes on paper. It might all make sense, but you don't really factor in um, the time it takes to get from one thing to another or, you know, your lunch break running over or anything like that. So I've been taking some time to rethink that routine. And obviously every routine, every new routine and change in your routine needs time to adjust to, to try it. So it's taken a while. Um, I at least want to give things a week, maybe even up to a month to try to figure things out. So in um, kind of mid January to mid February, I was working on like a, I think it's called Kanban, Kanban. Um, it's like a Japanese um, way of managing time and tasks, uh, I believe, that came from like Toyota. Um, but I discovered it through a channel here on YouTube, um, like a self-published author. Um, the channel's called Heart Breathings. I'll leave a link to it below, but she uses it in more of a creative way, uh, the way that someone that is self-employed or someone that has like a side hustle would use it. So I, I would recommend it if you're looking for a new planning system, but essentially you uh, write out like um, three months worth of all your tasks, all the main things you want to get done that really tie into whatever goals you have. So your your direction is already laid out for you um, and you're not throwing things in here and there day to day that aren't leading you to the place you want to go to. And then you transfer one or two things from that massive list into like a right now list. Um, and those are the things that you just focus on in that time, uh, whether that's every day you do that, you move something over and tackle that one thing that day, um, or if you have a week of things that you transfer over and those are the only tasks that you look at that week. And then when you're done, you move them to the done pile and it's really rewarding to watch that done pile fill up. So I was trying something similar to that. Um, some people do it, I, most people that I've seen do it on a physical board uh, with like post-it notes. I wasn't really keen on doing that. I just couldn't, A, couldn't be bothered and B, I felt like I've got so many tasks that I would be using so many post-it notes. So I decided instead to do it in more of a digital format. So I just set up a almost spreadsheet. I just used uh, Evernote and made a table on there and put all my tasks in. And yeah, I would just transfer things over and I would know what I was working on in that moment in time. And I would move over the things I finished, but I got to the end of the month and it wasn't really working for me. It worked for a week or so, but it just wasn't ideal. Um, and it didn't really, didn't keep me interested and it's just never a good thing if I'm not checking the list of things that I should be doing. So um, I moved on from that and I've kind of tweaked it for this new month, for March, where I do have a, an overall list of the things that I should be doing on certain days, but it's more relaxed in the sense that, for example, this week, say I had to film a video on one day, edit a video on another day, um, I don't know, I'm just actually looking at my list right now. Um, I had like this voiceover to do. Um, I wanted to take a class on schoolism and I had those split into different days, but because one day um, I ended up not feeling very well, I just kind of shifted everything to the next day. And I don't know, it's more flexible where I'm able to fit in the things that work at certain times. So it's more of a week view um, and yeah, it, I don't know. We're going to see. I've only been doing this for maybe the past week, uh, if that. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I'm feeling good. I'm feeling hopeful. I have actually pretty much 
<laughs> planned out my whole rest of the year now, but I feel really good about it. I know that for some people that might seem like a lot, but it's not, none of it's set in stone. It's just a, a good guide for me. Um, and now I know what I want to be doing and I'm more excited about it and I'm more driven. And it's like, even the things I don't really want to do, I know that I need to get them done so I can move on to the stuff that I do want to do. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling um, optimistic and I'm feeling a lot more motivated. I think the start of the year is always a difficult one for me. And I went in, I came into this year feeling more motivated than usual. Normally I have a massive January slump, but this year I managed to bypass that. But I think it just crept up a little bit later and uh, ended up hitting me at the end of January. And that's a part of why I wasn't really uploading at all during February, like after coming back from Edinburgh. Uh, it took me a long, long time to settle back in and it, eventually I just resigned myself to giving myself some time to prepare myself for March so that I could come into this month with a lot more backed up behind me so I can really commit to getting stuff out and getting stuff done. Um, so yeah, I guess what I'm saying is it's important to always adjust um, your your way of doing things. I mean, obviously if it's working for you then there's no reason to adjust it, but if things start feeling a bit stale, if you don't find yourself checking in on the things that you should be checking in on, if you feel kind of directionless or, yeah, just not sure of what you want or what you should be doing or, you know, what what the next thing should be, um, yeah, just have a moment to re rethink it, um, re-establish your goals and how you plan on getting there and what you're going to be doing day to day to get there and how you're going to keep track of that. Anyway, let's skip ahead um, and talk about the things that I have been working on and reading and watching since we last spoke. Also, what do you think of this way of doing things with me narrating after the fact rather than as I'm painting? I think you do miss out on my train of thoughts regarding the painting itself, like me saying, hmm, I think this is working, oh, maybe I'll put this here. But I also feel like I get to be a bit more cohesive while I'm talking, right? I already feel more comfortable right now. This feels more podcasty almost. Um, like I just, I don't know, I feel like I can get my words across a bit more clearly. But yes, okay, what am I working on? Again, to tie into wanting to do more with my art, I have wanted to start a new series on my channel where I essentially set my own commissions. So for example, this month I have designed an album cover just to push myself out of my comfort zone, see what I can or want to do with my art, and then also to open the floor to anyone watching to do the same. So I've made this album cover now, and even though the finish of it isn't the best, I'm not gonna lie, you'll see you'll see what I mean. Um, but I, I just really enjoy the project itself. It was really, useful in stretching the muscles of coming up with ideas again and thinking conceptually and just getting out of my comfort zone, thinking outside the box and making a piece of art that I ordinarily might not have. So that video should be up at the end of next week and I can't wait to see what you guys think of it and I would love for you to get involved too in designing your own album covers. Uh, other than that, I spent a lot of time preparing for my return to Patreon. Um, I've mentioned it a couple of times now, but if you if you hadn't noticed, I am back on Patreon after taking about a year off, just over a year. Um, and yeah, I wanted to put a lot of time into just making it perfect, <laughs> like coming back to it uh, just well prepared. Um, it didn't go entirely smoothly, I'm not gonna lie, uh, because, because I've previously had my Patreon live, um, back in 2018. Um, a lot of the patrons that had been there before were still signed up to be my patrons, even though the thing hadn't been active, it wasn't taking money or anything. Um, but once I relaunched my Patreon, it automatically had them signed up again. And I kind of, I didn't know this was gonna happen until I started trying to work on relaunching my Patreon. And it was impossible for me to message the people that were already patrons until I relaunched because um, I guess all of their info was private until I re, um, re entered that zone, I guess. So I wasn't able to give people warning. I, I could only warn people once I actually came back on there, um, but loads of people have been completely understanding. Some people, as I would expect, have moved on um, now that they know that I'm back there, just because, you know, imagine if you're signed up for something and after a year they just suddenly reappear. So. If you were a, patri a patron before and uh, you didn't know that I'm back on there, I am back on there. So just check 
um, check what tiers you're signed up to as well because all the tiers are different um, you may you may be paying money but not actually uh, signed up to a specific tier and not receiving any rewards uh, so yeah if you're if you were a former pat- patron please go on there just check if you um, no longer want to be a patron I completely understand um, but if you are interested in joining my patron uh, that would be lovely as well um, you could just go and have a look at what we're doing there's going to be like extra sketchbook spreads I'm essentially just going to share every single thing that I do in my sketchbook all the daily stuff because um I try to work in my sketchbook every morning so far this month I've been struggling but I suppose from probably about tomorrow onwards um I'm gonna get back into that habit and yeah I want to share all the day-to-day stuff um along with that there'll be extra videos there have been so many videos that I've wanted to make that I don't feel would fit necessarily on this channel um just things where I can get a bit more in depth a bit more personal um stuff that I wouldn't really feel comfortable sharing like out there out there but you know in in a more intimate setting it's it's just an opportunity for me to get more um open and let's see what else there'll be of course the well there'll be a discount in my shop as well um there will be uh the physical reward bundles which is like the most exciting part for me just being able to send out prints every month and stickers and sticker sets and original paintings if anyone wants those as well uh so yeah i'm i'm really excited and i feel I, i've just been waiting <laughs> to get back to it i left patreon um for for a year as i said just because at the time i had other things going on and i didn't feel like i was justified in asking for money when I couldn't um, I couldn't promise that I'd be able to deliver what people were there for even though you know everyone said that they were there for, to support and you know it didn't matter and I didn't want to be constantly trying to catch up or or anything else and I think at this point I am very much ready to take on that responsibility again and really make it a priority I'm really actually looking forward to putting more time into making art again um, and yeah, just shifting the focus really, because that's that's what Patreon allows me to do, just to make more art. Um, yeah, and you know, to be able to work in my sketchbook and work on developing my own art and share whatever I'm learning with other people. So I'm really, yeah, I'm I, I'm going to stop saying how excited I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I'm going to actually be doing the same with YouTube. So if you're if you're thinking, oh, but what about us over here? No, I'm going to be doing the same thing on YouTube. I'm going to be making the art that I want to make and the stuff that I think will help me develop and then making videos around that. Like in, rather than making art for the sake of a video, I'm going to be making art that I want to make, the art that I think is going to help me improve as an artist and the projects that I want to take on either just on a personal level or just like the things that I think are going to help me develop. And I'm going to be sharing that all with you because um, I know that it helps. Like <laughs> We all need that. We all need that direction. We need that um, to see other people's experiences. So yeah, I'm, I think you can tell. I just feel a bit more settled now at this point. So feeling really good, feeling really hopeful about the direction that everything's going in. And that's it really work-wise. I actually have, as I said, a really detailed plan now of the projects and the timeline that I want to work on this year. So it's just a case of getting my head down now and executing it. Now then, um, it's been a while since we've caught up on books. So there are a few to talk about today. Um, So quick catch up, and I'm going to keep it quick, I think. I have shelved Eat, Pray, Love for now. Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. I was listening to the audiobook after having listened to Big Magic, which I will recommend till the cows come home. One of my favourite, favourite, favourite books about um, creative living and just expressing yourself creatively. Um, And if you can listen to it on audiobook, I would really recommend it. I fell in love with Elizabeth Gilbert after hearing that book and it really made me want to listen to more audiobooks specifically by her. So I got Eat, Pray, Love um, on Audible and it's just it's just not really for me and it was kind of putting me off audiobooks in general unfortunately so I have finally finally um, just put that one away for now uh, with Audible you can either return things no questions asked which I'm not going to do for that one um, I'm just going to keep it and hopefully come back to it at some point when I'm more in the mood for that kind of story I'm also still listening to Start Now Get Perfect Later by Rob Moore Um, which is more of a self-help book. It's just about, I mean, the title's pretty self-explanatory. 
it's just about you know <laughs> either making hard decisions decisions in the workplace um or personal decisions and not overthinking and just getting on with things and being open to making mistakes and just carrying on and learning which is something that I try to talk about a lot on this channel um but <laughs> I've got to a point in that book where again it just feels like uh, I'm over it I've heard it I know I don't know I've got it on like 2.5 times speed now I really just need to get it done um but I've been distracted by other books um I think at this point I might be reading too many books at once so I think maybe over the next couple of days I will come back to that book just to finish it um just draw a line under it uh, I also finished Deliver Us From Evil by David Baldacci I think last time I spoke about it I was like moderately interested in it I really I, don't, I didn't even read it. I quite enjoyed the first half. Um, it's about like this spy guy. He works for a secret organization, like tracking down criminals. Like um, he's a bit of a James Bond. Uh, and yeah, for the first half, I was quite interested. It was set in Provence and I really felt like I was there and I liked the... I liked their plan, I liked the drama of it, I liked the suspense, um, that they're like tracking down this bad guy, really, really bad guy, and um, there's another, there's a woman there who is also an undercover agent, but for a, a different secret agency, they're both working to catch the same guy, neither of them knows each other is there, and they end up crossing paths, kind of having a bit of flirtation, which I thought was unnecessary, but you know, why wouldn't you? And yeah that part of the story was okay it wasn't really the kind of thing I would normally read but it's kind of like a, a holiday book the kind of thing you would read by the pool um and then it kind of reached its climax of that part and for me it could have ended there but there I mean that was only about halfway through the book if that uh so then they come back to London and after that I really just wanted the book to end I didn't like the writing I didn't like the characters they all seemed the same I didn't like their decisions um not, none of it seemed believable um even the action was kind of boring like the yeah I don't it, it just it just went downhill for me and uh any book where like I get the whole like will they won't they secret agents like both working together they're both young and attractive and one's a man and one's a woman so obviously at some point something's going to happen um but like at one point he's talking about the death of his fiance and how he's so damaged by it and he wants all women to stay away from him because every woman that's around him gets hurt and as far as I know the first book in this series because this is a series um the other woman in that ends up getting hurt because she's in love with him as well and now there's this new woman in this book and he's trying to put her off and he's crying about his dead fiance and her response to that is to take her clothes off and get on top of him so at that point I just had to roll my eyes and yeah just kind of you know when you look ahead in a book just to see how much you've got left and if you can bear to carry on I was very happy <laughs> I was very happy when that one finished um which is unfortunate I mean if you if you ever do take my recommendations and you thought about getting this book the first half um decent I would give the first half like a 3.5 out of 5 um it's just the rest of this the rest of it that uh, wasn't my cup of tea but after that I read The Woman in the Window by AJ Finn which is a thriller it's about a woman who has agoraphobia she's stuck inside her like big new york townhouse and she spends her time spying on her neighbors basically with binoculars and her camera actually it's coming out as a film soon so you've probably seen the trailer um but yeah one day while she's watching her neighbors out the window she sees one of the wives seemingly getting murdered and so she obviously contacts the police uh, the police come round and they say that this wife has not been murdered and here she is uh, in in the flesh and the woman that they say is the wife that she saw dying is just a completely different woman so yeah you're it's like you're kind of following her and wondering if she saw what she thinks she saw um sorry I'm just I read it quite a while ago so I'm trying to remember like what the gist of it was it what it's very similar to um the girl on the train where a woman sees um another woman did she see her getting murdered from the train I've only seen the film of that I haven't read it I might read it 
um but yeah it's that kind of thing like the um narrator that you can't necessarily trust because they have like an alcohol problem um there's a lot of that it was kind of a typical of that that kind of genre of thriller that the woman who is single and mentally a bit unstable and maybe has an alcohol problem or maybe has whatever problem it is and no one believes her and then she starts not believing herself um you know that kind of story but I, I, I quite enjoyed it it was everything I wanted it to be um there were a few twists and turns I would say that I predicted most and the twists that I didn't predict I was a bit like oh okay <laughs> underwhelming uh, but I, I unfairly just judge everything in accordance to how well it stacks up to uh, how well it stacks up against Gone Girl, which is one of my favourite thrillers, probably one of my favourite books of all time. Um, and some people may say it's quite basic, but the twist in that that's about what, like a few chapters in that took me fully by surprise. I had to turn back and um, just <laughs> read back and think, did that really happen? So everything I re I've read since then, I have to compare it to that, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, let's quickly have a break. Let's stretch our legs. Um, I'm going to have a drink and we'll get back to the books in a second. Okay, welcome back. So we were talking about The Woman in the Window by AJ Finn and I did enjoy it. I really liked it. It got me back into the joy of reading um, and it was guys my first library book I did get my library card at last um, and yeah it's just my favorite place ever uh, as I spoke about it last time I was just saying that I needed somewhere that I could walk to um, to get me out of the house to get me moving um, and somewhere where uh, you know, a safe, a safe place, somewhere where my anxious self could go without feeling like I'm going to be bothered or talked to or anything. And it's just perfect. It is amazing. I love the walk there because I can go like through back streets and I don't see anyone. Um, I don't know. It's just, and then when you get there, it's a beautiful building. The staff are really helpful if you need them, but otherwise they leave you to it. Um, and they have all the books you can need. Also, you can like reserve books online. Um, if they don't have the books in, they'll get them from somewhere else, like within our council and bring them over. So yeah, I, it's just my dream. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite place. Um, so yeah, The Woman in the Window was my first library book. And then next I picked up Dolores Clair Clairborn, Clairborn by Stephen King, which was recommended by Flissmark. Um, after I spoke about reading Misery as my first Stephen King book, Fliss recommended this one as a, a good one to move on to after that because his books can be a bit hit or miss. And yeah, absolutely right. I really, really liked it. I actually read it in about three days. So yeah, keep the recommendations coming, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, it seems like you know my tastes very well. Um, that This book is about like a... It takes the format of like a uh, police interview but you're only hearing the point of view of the person that's essentially being accused of killing their elderly, the elderly woman that they cared for. Um, so you're just hearing her story and what led to her being, um, was she arrested? Or she's just in the police station speaking about it, giving her statement. So you, you hear her telling her, or you read of her telling her story in the lead up to that. And yeah, I really liked it. Um, I think the format takes a second to get used to and the the narrator's voice takes a second to get used to um just the way they um I keep saying speak and like voice but like the way um it's written takes a bit of getting used to uh but yeah I really really liked it thank you for the recommendation as always your recommendations are always always welcome because I feel like you guys never get it wrong I do have a massive list already so if you've recommended things before and I haven't mentioned them yet don't worry they are on the list um, but yeah, keep them coming. At the same time, I picked up a book called How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and it's about how diet can prevent or cure disease, um, and like the top six diseases or something, um, or is it even top 15, like um, high blood pressure and lung cancer and um, I don't know, blood cancers and depression. Um, I, I don't know why this book was on my list. I must have seen it in a video. Um, someone may have recommended it. Um, because when I picked it up, I didn't realise that it's like 
all about a whole food plant-based diet. That is the message. <laughs> it starts with him saying that he's not biased, um, although he is part of the Humane Society and he doesn't um, eat meat or whatever. Uh, it's just that every argument he makes in the book is for a whole food plant-based diet. And there's a lot of science in there. There's a lot of um, references that he uses. Um, he is a doctor. He has years and years, decades even, in the industry or in his craft. Um, and I've learned a lot about the industry of medicine and nutrition, how nutrition isn't profitable, uh, so it isn't talked about as much um, in a medical sense. Um, the industry of meat and um, how how they have these kind of monopolies on or they have a lot of control over what can be said um, at least in America I think a lot of it is hard to really relate to because a lot of it I know isn't true for Europe and the UK um, and it's quite scary the stuff about America like the antibiotics and things that they're putting in animals um, and how that's ending up in the water uh, the book itself I I've learned some things but I'm uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not um, plant based. Okay, I don't eat a plant based diet. I've hugely cut out meat and animal products. I probably ha I'm probably vegetarian like most days out of the. In fact, almost every day I probably eat meat once a week, and I probably eat like plant based two or three days a week. But I don't like pay attention that much to it I'm paying attention a lot to trying to minimize the amount of meat and animal products I eat but I'm also not that strict with it um, and that's obviously for environmental reasons for moral reasons for all the reasons um, I just I'm in, I'm in more of the camp of reducing I think if everyone cuts down um, it's going to make a huge impact rather than expecting everyone to give everything up completely I unfortunately I don't think that's realistic um, or at least not at least not yet but I think reducing and you know really promoting the reduction of our consumption of animal products is fantastic I think anyone that does any little bit is doing a great job despite what anyone else might think um, I think to just actively make some kind of effort is a good start um, this book is helpful in understanding nutrition uh, <laughs> Some of it, I think, is quite biased. Some of it, I think, is... He, he may have cherry-picked some of the uh, studies that he quotes or some of the results. Um, yeah, the way that everything points to a whole food plant-based diet or some of the really crazy stuff that... it Well, to me, it's crazy, the stuff that it says about meat, about, like, how a quarter of a chicken breast can, like, lower your... or increase your chance of pancreatic disease by like 70 percent or something also yeah apologies if you can hear children outside but <laughs> um i kind of lost my train of thought there because uh there were children outside and then the doorbell rang and i didn't answer the door because i'm not expecting anything so um yeah <laughs> don't want to be bothered right now uh yeah so this book i have skipped ahead by quite a few chapters now just because it gets a bit repetitive um, you know, have you got lung cancer? Eat more broccoli. Um, no, it's not. I'm, I'm really doing it a disservice because I've learned so much from it. And I actually would recommend it to anyone that is interested in nutrition, even if they're not interested in um, a plant based diet. Um, I've even as someone that has always eat, eaten a very I think a good balanced diet honestly um, I was brought up to eat loads of vegetables um, and just having mainly vegetables on my plate has been um, like a norm and yeah I think I've just naturally had a good balanced view of what makes a good meal anyway but even having had that I am learning a lot more about other nutritional needs um, and yeah, it's, it's made me want to introduce a few more things into my diet and even um, just adjust things a bit here and there. So I'm sorry if I've been a bit um, critical of it because I'm, I, I don't think that's particularly fair. I've just skipped ahead now because I did find it quite repetitive um, and it's a hard one to read. I was actually practicing my speed reading um, 
through the process of reading this book. I don't speed read a lot just because I like to amble my way through a book. Um, I like to, um, yeah, just enjoy it. And in this one, it was very hard to get through. There's a lot of medical speak. And um, as I said, it's quite repetitive for me anyway. So um, I've just been practicing my speed reading, which is, uh, yeah, it's fun. Um, there are a lot of videos on YouTube about how to speed read. So um, just have a search because it's been fun practice and it helps me actually pay more attention because you have to. Uh, so I think if you ever have a book that you're struggling to get to get through, try speed reading because it's been helpful. I don't think I could have read as much of this book as I have, um, but I'm going to try and finish it soon just because uh, that's another library book. I've had it for maybe about a month now. Um, and I can renew it as many times as I want. I can renew it online um, 15 times. So I could probably keep it for over a year if I just kept renewing it every three weeks. Um, I'm sure someone that's good at maths <laughs> will be able to work that out. I can renew it every three weeks for, for 15 times basically. Um, but I do know that someone has reserved it and that doesn't make any difference. It just means that someone wants it. Um, someone's waiting for it and I can still carry on renewing it as much as I want, but I would rather just give it back because <laughs> obviously someone else wants it and I'm it doesn't feel fair to me to for me to like read a few pages and then put it back down and then come back to it a few days later when there's someone out there waiting for it so I'm just going to try and read as much of it as I can um take as much from it as I can um but as I said I've skipped up ahead to the second part the second part of the book is more about the foods that you should be kind of introducing and how so I think I'll get a lot more value from that part um but that is uh, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, I would love to know why that book ended up on my radar. Um, and then after that, I read a book called A Keeper by Graham Norton. Yes, the Graham Norton. I knew he'd written like autobiographies and things, but I didn't know he wrote fiction. So this is his second book. Um, and it really surprised me. It's about um, this woman, this Irish woman, whose mother dies, she goes to clear out her mum's house in this like rural Irish town and basically digs up um, her mum's past. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's not the kind of book that I would be drawn to really, but it, it took me by surprise. I only read it because my mum had been reading it and she said she was surprised by it and that I would probably like it. And she was right. It was quite funny at times. Um, and then it took more of a turn. Uh, it was it was really, I don't know, it was a bit of a mystery. Um, and it just had a bit of Graham Norton's like um, wit and a bit of his cheekiness. I, I would say for the first few chapters, it was hard not to see him or like hear him um, writing it. But after a while, you really did, I don't know, really get into it. And I was really, really surprised. Um, I would recommend it, honestly. I didn't want it to end. I remember at one point, a few chapters in, I was reading it in bed next to Ozzy and it really made me chuckle. And I just looked at him and I was like, this is actually really good. Um, I suppose uh, past the halfway point, it took more of a different turn. When, I, when the story really started to get into full swing, um, it changed tone a bit just because I think the more light-hearted stuff was for the beginning um and I just wanted it to stay like that honestly because I really enjoyed it but um obviously when it gets a bit more serious um that was all fine as well and the story is really quite gripping and interesting you just want to know the truth and at the end I wasn't that keen on it's one of those books that likes to kind of wrap things up and have everything settled at the end which I don't find necessary but uh, yeah, I, I'm very, very impressed and I would definitely read a Graham Norton novel again. And yeah, who knew? I didn't know that he even wrote fiction. So I'd, I'd check out his first book. Uh, my mum said that she has read that now as well and I don't think she liked it as much. But um, yeah, I would definitely, definitely be interested in seeing more of his work. Uh, and since then, I haven't had a chance to go back to the library. So fortunately, they actually have an app uh, called Borrowbox. I don't know if, um, I know that people have talked about Libby, but Libby wasn't available for my library. Um, so I think maybe it's more of a UK thing, Borrowbox, um, but I can get audiobooks there, eBooks, all for free, obviously. Um, I am keeping my Audible subscription for now, uh, but we'll see, we'll see. Because there, there is more on Audible and they have Audible originals and all that good stuff. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just checking out what my library app has to offer. And I downloaded an ebook of a book that's been on my list for a while. It is Severance by Ling Ma. And oh my God, love it, love it. I love like an epidemic type book anyway. <laughs> I should explain what the book's about. It's set in New York and it follows um, a woman called Candice Chen. She is, I think, a second generation immigrant um, and she is just going about her life trying to settle her feelings about, about like identity and um, her feelings towards her parents who obviously came to the US to give her a better life. And um, there's a lot of background stuff there uh, but at the same time there is a virus going around that is at you know pandemic level and you jump back and forth in the timeline so at, at some points in the book you are essentially at like the end I mean it's called the end uh, she is with a group of about eight survivors and but then you also look back at her time uh, just trying to kind of carve her way through life as a young woman in New York, um, trying to achieve something or be something. And it's just beautifully written, really like real, uh, really raw. Um, I, Whenever I talk about it, I say it's Severance by Candice Chen, who is the name of the main character, because like, Candice to me is such a real person. Um, it's by Ling Ma. Um, so yeah, I, I love it. And I'm, it's quite a short book. I've been reading it for a few days and I think I'll probably be done by the weekend. Well, by the time you're watching this, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's probably top top 10 favorite books uh, for now anyway. I always forget all the, all the rest of the books that I've read, but it's a, it's a good one for me for sure. And I will definitely read more of her work. Uh, but that is it for books. I need to think about what I want to read next. I am going to head over to the library probably at the start of next week. So um, yeah, if you've got any recommendations, by the time you're watching this video, I'll probably still have a bit of time. So anything that you can recommend, just let me know. All right then, and for films, again, it's been like two months since we last caught up on all this. So there are quite a few. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of my favorites in depth, and then we will finish with a quick fire round of all the rest. So to start with, I watched a film on, I think, Amazon Prime called Prisoners. Uh, it's a film with Hugh Jackman, Jake Gyllenhaal, like Terrence Howard, Viola Davis, so quite a few good people in it. And you probably saw it advertised. I remember seeing it advertised. It's about like, these two dads, but mainly Hugh Jackman, um, their daughters get abducted on, I think, Thanksgiving, and they are just trying to get through that harrowing time and find the, peop the people or person that has taken their young children, I think they're eight, and they're just trying to find their daughters and they're doing whatever it takes to be able to get their daughters, basically. I won't spoil it, but they get a bit... Um, vigilante <laughs> if you can say that and it's I think the whole point of it is to make you think and it did make me think even as someone that obviously doesn't have children um I was thinking along the way like how far would I go if I felt that I knew that you know if I had a suspect in mind and they weren't being pursued would I pursue them myself like you know it makes sense really the desperation that some people would have to just find their child. So uh, it was an interesting one. I thought it was well done. I liked a lot of the acting. Um, the story itself, it did keep me hooked. I really wasn't that sure what, what was going to happen. Um, one thing that really bugged me and took me out of it was the closed captioning. On Amazon Prime, the subtitles were really bad like bad spelling bad timing um just just really inaccurate and i watch things with subtitles a lot of the time just because i live on a main road and um there'll be like traffic outside and i don't like having the tv really loud because i also have neighbors so um yeah i just watch things with subtitles so i don't miss anything especially stuff like that where you don't want to miss any major plot points because there's a bus driving past um so i uh, just that on its own just really annoyed me just really took me out of it just it, like amazon is a big company they can afford to get some proper captioning done um i also recently watched a film on netflix called ghost stories 
which I also remember being advertised, but I didn't really know what it was about. I thought, I think because I thought, I saw that Martin Freeman was in it and I just kind of assumed that it would be slightly funny. Um, it's this story of a man who is a skeptic and he essentially debunks um, mediums and things. He is given the task of debunking three different ghost stories. So he tracks down the people who have had these ghostly experiences and he's there to figure out what really happened. Um, when it started, when they did the first ghost story, I, and I love, I love horror stuff, okay? I, I live for that. I was so freaked out. I was so, I think they really built tension for the first ghost story and I was home alone Ozzy was actually in Bratislava at the time, so I knew I was going to be alone like all night and for the next few days. And I, at one point, I was reaching for the remote because I thought I shouldn't be watching this because um, I'm going to freak out and I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. And I, as I said, I watch horror movies all the time, so it's a very rare thing for me to feel like that. And then, <laughs> and then it just got into usual horror movie territory did all the cliches hand reaching around a corner and the music all swelling and then creepy little ghost girl in a little dress saying oh my god are you my daddy and yeah it just took me out of it completely it got a bit goosebumps honestly it got maybe not goosebumps maybe what was it called are, are you afraid of the dark was that the more scary one on like nickelodeon um just with the effects like for me a ghost that's like got grey skin and bad teeth and blood and it goes rah and comes out of the dark that isn't very scary for me but I was grateful for that honestly because it <laughs> just calmed me down a bit to be able to roll my eyes at it and the way the film ended as well I wasn't I was like oh okay <laughs> but then I found out that it was based on a play and that made sense somehow it just felt like it it would have been really effective as a play um but as a film it, it felt like he didn't really get anywhere for me um and also there was this whole thing about his sister that I thought was going to be a thing and then just didn't come back into question which I was very very curious about so if anyone knows more about that film and there's something about the sister that I missed um let me know um I also watched Horse Girl on uh <laughs> Netflix there we go um which you may have heard about I've seen I watch a lot of film commentary channels so a lot of people have been talking about it it's another kind of psychological but also quite funny um well it starts out quite funny it's about this young woman i think she's about to turn 30 maybe um although she, no, she didn't really look anyway she's reaching a birthday and she loves horses she works in like this hobby crafts type shop and she hasn't really got any friends she's obsessed with this tv show um that's kind of like kind of like Bones or Supernatural, like a mix of the two. And um, it's just weird things start happening to her and she starts to think that she's being abducted by aliens. It just, it gets, it goes from like being kooky and a bit like Napoleon Dynamite-y, a bit like awkward and funny to getting more and more unsettling. And um, from what I have read about it, it's about like a decline of mental health um which would 100 percent make sense it seems kind of she has kind of almost um like psychosis um hallucinations uh uh it's a very interesting film i think it's interestingly done i enjoyed it but i don't know if enjoyed is really the right word and then the end is the kind of end to a film that makes you think what <laughs> what did I just watch? Um, but it's my kind of film. I, I can see why people wouldn't like it. But for me, I like a film that's a bit weird and a bit, um, yeah, just a bit unusual. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about all the films, but so the only other film that I will talk about in detail is Midsummer or Midsommar. Um, and this was, and it's, 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 um, you probably again have seen it um, or heard of it. It's by Ari, 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 yeah, it must be Ari, Asta, um, who did Hereditary, which to this day is probably the scariest, but not like scariest, just the most disturbing film I've ever watched. I love Hereditary, probably, yeah, again, like top five films, um, but I've never been so shell-shocked by a film, so just disturbed, like deep down, just shaken by a film. Um, 
And so the same person made mid, I'm going to say mid, midsummer, midsummer, midsummer. I might just say midsummer because it's easier. Um, and this is a much lighter film. It's still horror. It's about a young woman who loses her family tragically and joins her boyfriend at this like Swedish retreat and um, comes to learn gradually maybe that it's it's just very cult-like and um, yeah I mean I won't say I won't say more than that but we watched it as part of it's the first film that we watched in a horror movie club that a few of my friends and I have started um, we're all kind of the the outcast in, in the sense that we all like horror films and no one else will watch them with us um so like i obviously i live with ozzy he hates horror films he won't watch them with me and everyone else is in a similar position where the people they're around or with don't want to watch horror films so we have come together to watch horror films together and that was our first one and i think everyone really enjoyed it um i thought the acting was really good um one thing i forgot to say about horse girl the acting was amazing of the main the main actress i don't know her name but there was one scene where she steps out of the shower and she isn't where she thinks she was going to be and she has a bit of a breakdown and in that moment oh my like my whole body was just burning like with like feeling how she felt um so yeah she i have to say she really emoted that well um but yeah midsummer 10 out of 10 loved it um and it wasn't as like disturbing or scary it was much just like it was more colorful it was more like cinematic it was brighter it was still creepy and gory at times um i think there were f- six of us at the start of the horror movie club and at one point um one of the girls india just got up and left she even left half of her mince pie there she was like nope can't can't do this can't watch this because it did get quite gory um but other than that i mean i don't mind that kind of stuff so yeah i really liked it and then okay do we have time for the quick fire film round um so i said that i watched john wick 2 last time i think i've watched them completely out of order i watched john wick 3 then john wick 2 and now i've seen the end of john wick 1 um so that's that i watched a film called hush with gwyneth paltrow and like jessica jessica lange jessica lange um it's like a late 90s film it's about this crazy mother-in-law who is really controlling and uh, just does some wild things to keep uh, Gwyneth Paltrow under her thumb and keep her son under her thumb. Um, I love that kind of horror film, like the old, well I say old, you know, late 90s, 90s type, um, like those bunny boiler type films, I love those. Um, I watched the Aaron Hernandez documentary about the NFL player who uh, potentially committed several murders and was still like playing in the Super Bowl um, because he wasn't a suspect at that time. Um, really interesting. I may I may talk about that um, in the next video because we appear to be wrapping up here. Um, anyway, that's where we'll leave it for today. I hope you enjoyed this slightly different way of doing things. Let us know down below what you managed to get done during this hour. And thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Thank you especially for watching and I'll see you soon for the next video. Bye.